Welcome to tonight's edition of the Cummings Conversations, Brain Secrets for Exercising Your Mind, Your Body, and Your Faith for a Complete and Fulfilling Life. These presentations are all part of the mission and ministry of the Maryville Center for Campus Ministry. Originally known as February Meetings, Maryville College has held these conversations about faith, learning, in a, in a complicated world for over 146 years. As a part of the college's bicentennial in 2019, to honor Margaret Cummings, who taught Bible and religious education at Maribel for 29 years, February meetings became the Margaret M. Cummings Conversations on Faith, Learning, and Service. Ma Cummings, as she was lovingly known by her students, lived forward and to the fullest for over 101 years, overcoming personal hardships, always teaching and learning, always creating and leading the first international Maryville College trip abroad for students and being elected the first woman elder at New Providence Presbyterian. And from what I know about Ms. Cummings, she would likely be sitting on the very front row tonight and loving this presentation. We want to give special thanks tonight to Dr. Bill Carl for bringing the good news of neuroscience to the Cummings Conversations this year. And Dr. Carl has not only spent extensive time tailoring and focusing these presentations specifically for the Cummings Conversations, but he is also sharing his work as a gift to Maryville College and to the community. So will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Carl and showing our appreciation for all of his work. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all for being here. I'm glad you came back. This is great. A wonderful crowd. And I want to share, before I start this particular presentation, with a simple fact. I just heard this and read this the other day. So you're gonna keep some figures in your head. A zettabyte is one billion terabytes. Got that one? A zettabyte, Z-E-T-A, is one billion terabytes. A terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. Now how much computational capacity does it take to simulate a human brain? It's a zettabyte. So there is that much com computational capacity within our brains that is equal to running the whole planet right now. Just think about that for a moment. We've talked about the billions of neurons bouncing in your brain, making trillions of synaptic connections, and the fact that there are more synaptic connections going on in your brain then there are stars in the Milky Way and in many of our galaxies, which means you can do way more than you think you can. That's what we've been talking about. So, AI, computers, eat your heart out. You know, they're great, they're amazing, but they're not as amazing as what is inside your head and mine right now. So, oh, and by the way, we only have one Baptist in the group here, right on the, you know, the front row. I mean, where are all the, okay. Actually, uh, Islamic Judeo Seventh-day uh, Unitarian. You're an Islamic Judeo Seventh-day Unitarian. Well, I've never seen that in an ad audience before. Tonight, for our last lecture, we are going to go into these brain secrets. And I'm going to start with our founder here at Maryville College, Isaac Anderson, who has a wonderful mantra, and all the students know this, and, and certainly all the faculty and staff. Uh, his mantra was, do good on the largest possible scale. And this mantra fits the very best advice from neuroscience, and it's, it's what we'll be talking about throughout these lectures, uh, this lecture this evening. I talked about soteria at the end of 
the first lecture as the word for salvation, which is this enormous word. It's not a little me and Jesus word. It's a word that means wholeness, peace, oneness, harmony. It is what we experience when we remember that our whole bodies are experiencing salvation. It's not just our little spiritual soul. And remember that the soul in Hebrew means all of who you are. So I've tried to make sure that physicians, when they are treating patients, care about the whole person. And Harold Koenig at Duke University Medical Center has talked about how that actually helps the healing process. Now, I will be quick to say, if I have a choice between a cardiologist, a cardiosurgeon, who's gonna do my quintuple bypass, and, and this cardiosurgeon is uh, kind of an SOB, not very good people skills, but really, really good at the clinical side and the surgical side. And a choice between that and somebody who's just got amazing people skills, really cares about me, but a little sloppy with the surgery, I'll take the SOB, right? I want somebody who's gonna do a good job on the clinical side. However, I want both. And that's what I'm really trying to say in these lectures, that physicians and all kinds of healthcare providers need to understand about both. Now, by the way, as I've done these lectures at medical schools and medical conferences, and at grand rounds at hospitals around the country and internationally, nurses are always cheering because nurses already understand what I'm talking about uh, in these lectures. Uh, now, this is really about both grace and good works, which I have up here. But I wanna talk about the importance of exercise, and I'm gonna get to it in a little bit later when I talk about delaying dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, not, you never can actually prevent it, but you can delay it by exercising your body and exercising your mind. I'll get to exercising your mind uh, in just a little bit, but let me just stop and talk about how important exercise is. We know uh, one of the other mantras here at, at Maryville College is fit, green, and happy, and it's a great one. Um, Years ago, uh, uh, I was told, you know, you need to kind of get out there and you need to exercise. And, you know, for a long time, it was kind of like, if I got the urge to exercise, you know, I would just lie down and wait for the urge to pass, you know. Uh, but at First Presbyterian Church in Dallas, the personnel committee sent all of us on the pastoral staff to the Cooper Clinic there in Dallas, the aerobic center, for a real big, a huge physical that CEOs come from around the world to get, and it cost a lot of money and all that. And we spent a whole day, I mean, doing everything, peeking into every part of us. And I was in my late 30s, so this is, you know, almost 40 years ago. And uh, at the end, they put me on a treadmill and hooked me up to everything, and I got going. And uh, I said, how long do I go? They said, you go till you drop. And okay, so I kept going the best I could, and I finally just collapsed. And they, laying out, out on a table, and this uh, nurse said, now don't move. I said, there's no chance, I can't possibly move. And, and the doctor says, I'm gonna do the readout now. We've done all the tests and everything. He said, here's the, here's the news. You're overweight, you're out of shape, your cholesterol is too high, and one more Big Mac and you're gonna have a heart attack. I said, have you got anything nice at all to say to me? He said, I've been wanting to say this for a long time. Repent, Reverend. <laughs> I said, you're enjoying this entirely too much. He said, you have a church of almost 2,000 members, you have a staff of 100, uh, you, have, you have two sons, or you have a wife and two sons, you have a lot of people depending on you. you. You don't have time to be having a heart attack and going down. You know, you need to stay in shape. And so I began working out a lot. And you know, you go ups and downs when you do it better than other times. I retired three years ago, somebody gave me uh, this book, I don't know if you all are familiar with this book, uh, Younger Next Year by Chris Crowley. It's a, it's a bestseller, international bestseller. Uh, Younger Next Year, live strong, fit, and sexy until you're 80 and beyond. And this guy just cracks you up. It's so well written. And he just, every time you think, I don't know, he kind of kicks you in the butt and says, no, you need to get up and get moving. And the truth is, the more you exercise, the better it is for your brain. Now, I, w I met somebody before the second lecture today. Uh, I think his name is Robbie Paul. I don't know if he's here tonight. Robbie, are you here? Yep, he's here. 
And he uh, used to work at Asbury, and he said he had read a study, uh, I don't know, recently or a few years ago, about uh, some neurologists who had done tests on what difference does it make whether you exercise or you don't uh, for uh, delaying uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And they found out through the testing that sure enough, it does make a huge difference. And they said, well, let's find out what kind of exercise. Is it on a treadmill? Is it aerobic? What is it? And they found out walking is very, very important. Uh, but then they found out even more important than that is dancing, and specifically line dancing. Okay, now why is it line dancing? It's because you have to think about what you're doing when you do it. You have to move certain directions. And what is going on in your brain when you're having to do something different like that? Ne neurons are making new synaptic connections. And the more synaptic connections that our neurons make with exercise or with using our minds, the more we will delay dementia and Alzheimer's because plaque doesn't have a chance to set up. Um, you know, another uh, fact is, is social isolation. You need to be with people. You need to be with people a lot uh, to help de delay dementia and Alzheimer's. Another is diet. Um, I kind of love this one. I saw it the other day. Three things are really, really good. One is mushrooms. I love mushrooms. Another is vegetables. Yeah, I kind of like vegetables. The third one is dark chocolate and cinnamon. Bring it on, you know. Uh, it didn't say anything about the proportion, uh, and some people maybe put too much on that third one, but mushrooms, huh, all right, and vegetables, and dark chocolate, and cinnamon. Uh, now, uh, so I, I got this uh, experience of exercising, and one day I broke my ankle playing tennis. And so I was on crutches for six weeks. It was a stress fracture of the lateral malleolus, that little ankle bone down there. So I hadn't told anybody at church, and as the choir came in, processing in with the first hymn, here I come on my crutches, and there's a huge gasp, a, co a, a collective gasp in the congregation. I came up to the pulpit when it was time to preach. Somebody had put a bar stool behind the pulpit. So I put the crutches down, nestled up on the bar stool, and I looked out and I said, now this is probably not the first time some of you have heard advice from a bar stool. You're just not used to hearing it in church. And then I went on and preached from the bar stool for six weeks. That was kind of fun. I think they got more out of those sermons at that time. But the point is, at the end of that, I went for physical rehabilitation. And this very nice young woman took my foot and she went, <coughs> she said, did that hurt? I said, lady, that would have hurt if I hadn't even broken my ankle. She said, well, you only have to do this 40 times a day with this TheraBand. And I said, why? And she said, because look, your, your ankle is atrophied and you need to rebuild it, or you'll break again, or you'll sprain it. Well, the same is true of our faith. If we don't exercise our faith along with our minds, then when the first trauma comes, the death that just overwhelms us, or a divorce, or some tragic thing that happens, like what's just happened in Nashville, if you have not strengthened your faith, if you have not exercised it, then it will run right over the top of you. So I want to talk to you about how five marks of active growing churches are part of exercising our faith. And I want to use John Wooden and Pat Summit as models, two of the greatest coaches in the history of basketball with March Madness, which is really mad because no one is able to choose the actual bracket that's going to end up. Whoever does is going to make millions of dollars, obviously, because it's like way off. John Wooden believed in the basics, uh, not as basic as Adolph Rupp at Kentucky, who came out one day, and he always started his practice, gentlemen, this is a basketball. Now, it wasn't that basic, but John Wooden believed that his players should be in better shape, so they're never hanging on like that. They should never miss free throws. They should never hog the ball. They should never show off. They always worked as a team. Now, there were a bunch of them. And they're very similar to what Pat Summit did. Uh, in fact, this little quote, I don't know if you can see that. It's, it's, Pat Summit says, here's how I'm going to beat you. I'm going to outwork you. That's all there is to it. Great quote from Pat Summit. 
That's exactly how John Wooden operated. In fact, John Wooden believed in the basics and the fundamentals so much that did you know he and his team never watched the, the videos of opposing teams? Because he said, they're going to have to adjust to us because we're going to do the basics better than anybody. So what I'm going to name tonight are five basics of a live, active, and growing churches that I've observed uh, around the country uh, and around the world, because churches are booming in Asia, Africa, even some in Russia, which is kind of hard to imagine, uh, and South America. In fact, North America is kind of the mission field for a lot of those other places, because this North America is the only place in Europe in some ways that the church is not just booming. But I'm naming now the five marks of live, active, growing churches, the churches that are doing these things. And uh, I have a different way of naming these. Uh, one is, and I'll just do these very quickly and I'm going to go through them uh, in the lecture. One is that everyone in the church is reading the Bible every day. Every single person is reading the Bible every day. Another is they are praying every day. Another is they are modeling their faith. And the last two are social justice and evangelism. I want to unpack each of these. So uh, there's a great book out uh, by Carol Dweck called The New Psychology of Success. It's called Mindset and How We Can uh, Learn to Fulfill Our Potential. Uh, and what she talks about is how we get stuck in a fixed mindset. And if we have biases, then we're stuck in those. And, it, and we have to move beyond that to a growth mindset, but that may mean getting into some different culture that will open us to uh, being away from those kinds of biases and, and to be able to grow. And according to the way we look at these basics of the live, active, growing churches, the way you do that is to spend time in the scripture. Now, the, the, the big problem in the church today is biblical illiteracy. People just don't know the Bible anymore the way they used to. You used to have to memorize Bible verses back in the day, right? Uh, I mean, a, a preacher one Sunday up in Minnesota gave his congregation a pop quiz on the Bible. I would not advise that to any pastor here, but he did. He gave it, gave it out and let them take it and... Uh, and the average grade was a stunning 26%. And it wasn't even that hard. You know, who came first, David or Moses? Which testament is Jesus in? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, what, uh, he got a variety of answers. What are the epistles? They answered, the wives of the apostles. You know, I mean, you, 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 the biblical illiteracy is huge in our, in our country. Uh, also, there's a theological identity crisis going on where we really don't know what we believe. But uh, I, I think the, the whole point here is that we need to spend more time in the Scripture. And the reason is the Scripture helps us shape our identity, helps us know who we are as human beings, as people. Uh, you know, story shapes identity. So what the biblical writers are doing is they're changing... They're renaming the world, I guess is the way I would say it. They're renaming the world in the light of the Christ event. They said, you think this is the way the world is. It's Wall Street and Main Street and MTV or, or TikTok and, and, and uh, Twitter and, and social media. No, no. The Christ event is the way we need to see the world, the way we need to live and to understand the culture because then that changes our behavior. That helps us be more open to other people, helps us to be less racist, less biased, we need to get into the right culture. Now, if you get the wrong story, you know, you're imbued with that culture. Uh, when I was teaching Greek at Union Seminary in Richmond, I remember having a group of, of Greek students over to our house there, and we were having a kind of little gathering one evening. And it, at that point, Union Seminary had a lot, even though it was in the seat of the Confederacy there with Richmond, where they talk about the war of recent unpleasantness or the war of uh, northern aggression or whatever, but we had a lot of students from the north at, at Union Seminary. And I mean, from Michigan and Pennsylvania and all over. Well, in that gathering that night, they were all from somewhere in the north except one guy from uh, South Carolina. And we got to talking about the Civil War battlefields because I'd been gone, going to visit them, you know, Fredericksburg and, 
and uh, Spotsylvania and Chancellorsville, different ones, a bunch of them right there by Richmond. And uh, I remember when I said Chancellorsville, uh, this guy from South Carolina said, uh, let's see, that's where we lost Stonewall Jackson, isn't it? And the entire room turned to him in unison and said, what do you mean we? And he said, lousy me, this is the first time I ever talked about the war between the states and mixed company. <laughs> and he went on to say that his great-great-grandfather had given the prayer of invocation at South Carolina secession from the Union. Now, you know that the stories had been passed on in his family that had shaped his life. That was the culture. That was the pickle juice he was in as a cucumber. I mean, when you leave one culture, you have to begin to get filled with a different pickle juice. Well, he, he said, I, I think I've got a lot of things to learn here because I'd never been out of South Carolina before. It was just, it was a fascinating conversation. So when you have the wrong story, then you mislive the world. This is part of the reason for radical movements, black power, feminist movement. You've been told that you're not worth anything, but you are. So you need to understand what your true story is. You need to understand what your true identity is. And so the biblical writers are trying to help us understand what our real identity is. And when when we spend time in Scripture, it changes our brains, it changes our behavior, it changes who we are as people. And we got to spend time doing the study. I talk about how important it is to learn Greek, and I've taught Greek classes in Dallas and in Richmond and other places where I've been a pastor. And lay people, you know, they like to learn it. Uh, you know, what are seminary students but very bright lay people, right? So bring them on. Let's go. And some of them said, you know, I said, you want to really learn Greek? And, and one of them who'd been a, a professor at uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical School and, and turned down the deanship at Harvard and some other places and lectured all over. And I said, you want to take Greek? He said, yeah, some of us are pretty bright. Oh, of course, yes. That congregations are full of very bright people, so let's learn some Greek. And uh, I would actually tell the congregation, if you want to delay dementia and, e and Alzheimer's, take Greek. And they just signed up like crazy, you know, <laughs> right? And uh, you, should, you should just never stop learning. You should never, ever stop learning because you want to keep using your brain. Um, I remember when I uh, would get to the end of a Greek class, uh, every year at Union Seminary, I'd pass out the final exam and I would remind them that, you know, they're going to take this exam, they're going to take an exegesis course, and they may have to take an ordination exam, and then they may just forget it the rest of their lives. And I said, no, no, no. If you will just translate two verses a day, you know, if you lose it, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you, wanna, if you just translate two verses a day, you will be able to keep up with your Greek. I'd, I'd say that every year. Well, a few years later, after I was already in Dallas and I was in some airport and this student came up, a former student of mine said, Dr. Carl, you remember I had you for Greek class at Union Seminary? Yeah, I remember that. He said, did you remember what you told us the last day? And I said, well, I told you a few things. I he said, no, don't you remember what you'd said? And he told us if we just translate two verses a day, we'd, we'd be able to keep up with our Greek. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that now. And he said, I've been doing it ever since. I said, man, that is so good. I'm so glad to hear. Yeah, he said, yep, the same two verses every day. <laughs> well, that's better than nothing, right? Better than nothing. He had gotten the point better than some people probably had. I'm going to move to the second point, and that is that churches that are alive and active and growing are churches where the members are praying every day. And you, when you pray, and you get a little bit of neuroscience here, the spirituality is being experienced in what's called the parietal lobe, which is, you can see, up at the top, the white part. And here are the things that increases. It's listed up there, social awareness, empathy, and compassion. And it also decreases 
a lot of bad things. Look at the list. You can see for yourself. And especially worry. I was at a conference in Orlando one year, tall steeple preachers from all over the country. And uh, Lyle Schaller was the was a keynote speaker, and he was doing a lecture, and he started talking about worry. He says, we all worry way too much. You know there's a difference between worry and concern? Yeah. Concern is a good thing. He said, concern gives you an edge, makes you sharp, makes you focused. I'm concerned to be a good father, a good husband, a good grandfather, a good uh, leader when I had a job, you know. Uh, I'm concerned to try to do a good job of sharing this information with you all. So concern's a good thing. It doesn't affect your health, but worry affects your health. Some people think that if they just worry enough, they can keep ships afloat, you know, or they can, whatever they can do. They worry about their children. They worry about everything. And the worry is not good for you. He said, so, you know, and, it's, and some people will actually have a worry list, you know, do you have a worry list? Maybe you have a worry list. And, uh, and in fact, if it's not long enough, you just ask other people, could you add something to my worry list? And you add, and you just get loaded down with all this worry, right? And he said, the reality is you should only have two slots on your worry list. One is, where is my next breath going to come from? Well, that's a significant thing to worry about, right? And the second is a vacant slot for emergency worries, and nothing else goes on the worry list. And what you have to do is learn how to delegate those worries to other people. This was all senior pastors. That's what staff is for. Unless you're a micromanager, you learn how to delegate worries to other people to take care of it and to trust the process, trust the people. He said, now, I, uh, I have had asthma my whole life. This is Lyle Schaller speaking. He said, I have had asthma so bad that at one point I thought I was going to die, and so I have to carry this little atomizer around with me. And um, so, you know, I, I just have two slots on my worry list, and one's where's my next breath going to come from, and the second is emergency worries. I just keep it vacant. Learn how to delegate. And don't let people load stuff on you that causes you to worry. Um, so, in fact, when something comes up, deal with it then. Don't let it eat you up. So at church, after, after church, sometimes shaking hands, someone would get in my face and they'd go, I'm coming to talk to you tomorrow. And I'd go, okay, what's the subject? I'm not going to wait till tomorrow to worry about what this guy is all upset about. And then he goes, oh, my daughter's going through such a dog. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry to hear that but we will talk about it tomorrow. Now I'm not going to spend 24 hours worrying about it because deal with it instantly, right? Or delegate the worries. We were at a big retreat. Our session had gone to a retreat, all our elders, and we had 75 elders on our session. I thought that was a little more than we needed. Uh, we finally cut it down to uh, 60 at one point and then down to 45, but at one point we had a lot of elders. And we were at a retreat, and um, at the break, one of them came up to me and said, Dr. Carl, there's... There's a problem. I said, what? He says, the urinal's broken in the bathroom. And I go, you're talking to me about the urinal? I'm the senior pastor of this church. Go get the business administrator. He takes care of the urinals. I take care of the big potty. You know? And the point I'm making is, don't worry about stuff. Well, here's how this, you're going, how in the heck does this relate to prayer? Prayer is the ultimate way to delegate your worries. If you don't hear anything else from me tonight or any of these lectures I've given, I hope you'll hear this tonight. When you are worrying about something, here's the prayer. God, I have done all that I can humanly possible and plausible to deal with this situation. And there's, there's just nothing more I can do. It's yours. I am literally letting it go to you. That's what prayer really is. It's not making your little list of stuff you want. It's delegating your worries to God and then trusting that God is going to be with you 
to get through whatever it is. If you don't get, I, w- once I heard that at that conference in Orlando, I just don't worry about anything anymore, you know? I mean, I'm concerned about stuff. I'm concerned about our country. I'm concerned about our world, but it doesn't eat me up. I don't lose sleep over it. So people who are in churches that are alive and active and growing know how to pray. The third one is modeling. Uh, And it really shapes your brain, not only to experience modeling, but also to model your faith for others. Now, let me go back into the New Testament for a bit, back to Jesus uh, in the synagogue. Uh, We know that he was preaching a lot because the imperfect tense in Greek is used, which means he was doing it continuously. So the way it worked in the synagogue is they would read Torah and then they'd call on somebody. That's why not very many people sat on the front row, because you might get called on, right, to get up and, you know, get up and uh, give the sermon on the, on the thing, uh, on the passage just read. Uh, I love the story about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the famous preacher in England, who, uh, when he was a seminary student, was in a class, and the homiletics professor was saying, now you might get called on because somebody, something might happen to the preacher, and you might, they might just call you, get up here and give a sermon. In fact, let's, let's just try this. Spurgeon, get up here right now, and I'd like for you to give a, a three-point sermon on Zacchaeus. Well, you know, the whole class was sucking air, glad that he hadn't called on them, but Spurgeon started making his way up, and he, he came up to the, the podium in the classroom, and his mind was racing. I got a three-point sermon on Zacchaeus. Okay, let's see what I can do. Point number one, Zacchaeus was a little man, and That's the way I feel right now. Point number two, Zacchaeus was up a tree, and so am I. Point number three, Zacchaeus made haste and came back down. (laughs) Now, that was brilliant, right? No wonder he became a famous preacher, right? Well, Jesus is out there, like the kid in the class, hand up all the time. Yes, I I will give the sermon, because the Greek says he was preaching continuously. He was modeling for his disciples. And then they modeled for others, and through apostolic succession, that was passed on from generation to generation. You know how how important modeling is. I mean, it's it's amazing. And Jesus was a rabbi, and the Hebrew word for root for rabbi is rav, and I've got it up there, even in Hebrew on the far right, rav, R-A-V, which means, oh, great one. I want, I, want, I want to see it. Do we have any professors here tonight? T- teachers. If you have been a professor or are a professor or have ever been a professor or a teacher, are you? Anybody? Yeah. Stand up. I want to see you. Wherever you are, stand up. Any teachers, professors who've ever been a teacher or a professor anywhere, right? Now I want the rest of the audience to say, oh, great one. <laughs> All right? Everybody, oh, great ones. Yes, that's the proper way to address a professor, right? Because they are the great ones. And why are they the great ones? Because they are imparting wisdom and knowledge and experience that will transform not only your brain, but your whole life. And it will stick with you way beyond your graduation. Um, I had a teacher in, seminar, in uh, college named John Gammy, who uh, taught me Greek and a lot of other things. And he taught me the Lord's Prayer in Greek, which then I taught to many, many people. And uh, it goes, Pater, Hemon, Ha, and Toi, Sura, Nois, Hagi, Aste, To, Ta, Anamasu, El, Ta, To, He, Basileus, etc. A few years ago, uh, Dr. Gammy died cancer, something. But his pater hemon, ha and toisu and noise, still lives on in me. That, that, that's the power of teachers. You know? uh, my piano teacher that I mentioned earlier, Martha Boucher, taught us all these things. Taught us never stop playing when you're in the recital, you know. Keep going, no matter how scared you get. You know, she taught, I remember one day she said, uh, you got this piece perfectly now, this Beethoven sonata, you've got it. 
but you're just playing the notes. Now, I want to teach you the difference between merely playing the piece and really making music. What, what expression really is. She taught me all those things. She died a few years ago. But all that stuff still lives on in me. That's what teachers do. They live on in us. Those of you who are professors and teachers, you know you will teach and you wonder if who's getting what. And that sometimes they don't say much. And then they appear 20 years later and they may even come by your office shuffling along and they go, do you remember me? Oh yeah, you were my student, yeah. You know that thing you said in class one day? Well, it changed my life. <laughs> it changed my life. And you had no idea. You were the mentor, you were the model, and you had no idea how much impact you had and how much impact you've had on so many students. Way more than you will ever comprehend because you won't, you won't see it. Uh, Margaret Cummings was that way. D did some of you have her for a, for a professor? There are some of you, yeah. So um, I asked Jane to check with somebody who had had her, and um, she came up with some really, really different, uh, wonderful little uh, ex explanations of, of Margaret. Four, four phrases, gentle goodness, unstoppable, strong faith that came through in her teaching, and finally, passionate about her teaching, passionate about her subject. I had a crusty old professor in, uh, at Pitt, brilliant rhetorician, who taught a teaching practicum. So for those of us who were teaching assistants, going out and teaching classes at Pitt while we were graduate students, and he said, I want, to tell, I want to ask you, what is the most important fact for being a great, great teacher? The most important thing. And if you can answer to our graduate seminar there, if you can answer, you will get an A and you can don't have to come to the rest of this class. We were all yelling out stuff fast, like a great syllabus, you know, good, uh, good lectures, you know, all these different things. He said, nope, you're all wrong. The most important factor in being a great teacher is that you care that your students learn. Because if you care that your students learn, you're going to be passionate about your subject, you're going to have a great syllabus, you're going to have great lectures, all of those things are going to come. And that's what real models do. Now, modeling is also about um, giving people a chance to initiate. So I'm going to uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, babies and terrible twos uh, this afternoon and how uh, it's because the Broca's area is not completely developed in the brain. Well, one of the things I learned, I took a course uh, at Pitt in child linguistics and we listened to baby cries at five seconds old, one minute old, one hour old, one day old. They're different. You can hear you can hear the differences in the baby, in the crying and the baby sounds. And one of the things we learned in that class is that we initiate way too much as adults, right? You see a little baby, oh, goo, goo, goo. Aren't you like the jolly green, green giant? We scare the hell out of them. Instead, he said, you should imitate, you should imitate what they do. This is mirror neurons in neuroscience. You're imitating what they do. And when you imitate instead of initiate, and we're talking about little babies, you know, they can see your facial communication. They know what you, whether you love them or not from your face. Remember, facial communication, 70% of communication. They, they know, but you need to in, imitate what they do. Because when you imitate instead of initiating, they will try more sounds, and they will help them develop language better more quickly. So when I baptize babies, you know, I used to baptize babies when I was active as a pastor, I would ask the couple to come like 45 minutes early to my office, and I'd get down on the floor with the baby, 
And I would go, oh, yeah, and I would drool, and I would do this. And the parents thought I was crazy. But we were, we were bonding, you know. I was bonding with that baby with the mirror neurons by imitating this baby. We would go in for the baptism, and the parents were nervous, so the baby was crying because they were, the baby was feeling their nerves viscerally, and it would come to me and it would stop crying because we had bonded. I can stop babies from crying on airplanes. I literally can. You could too if you tried this. So a baby's crying, and you know the whole plane's like, oh my gosh, and I will go back to the mother, and I will go, could I ask you a couple of questions? Yes, shut up, kid, shut up. And then I said, no, no, let me ask you a couple. Is the baby teething? No, the baby's not teething. Has the baby been fed? The baby been changed? Yeah, it's all, yeah. I said, could I talk to your baby? Oh, yeah. And I'll get down in the baby's face and I'll go, it's just awful, isn't it? I really understand, whatever. And the baby looks at me like, what the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> and it stops crying because I felt its pain. And the whole plane cheers and I go back to my seat. So the point I'm talking about is, here is mirror neurons. Okay, this all works, by the way. This actually works with animals. I don't know. Jane and I were with the boys at the London Zoo, getting ready to go see Les Miserables. And I'm not big on zoos because I had to go to them all the time when I was growing up. But we got to the, you know, the uh, orangutan first, right? Jane was the orangutan. And I started imitating that orangutan. And we were, you know, we were connecting. It was a riot. I mean, and whatever, like this. And at one point, the orangutan came up and planted a big kiss right on the glass. And that was when the imitation stopped. And then we went over to Kimba the gorilla, 800 pounds, <clears throat> like this, you know, working his fingernails. Now, you do not want to look a gorilla in the face. You just don't want to do it. So I didn't look at him, but I started imitating his fingernail thing. He started noticing. He looked at me like, he had a mother over there, a little baby bouncing around. <clears throat> oh, he noticed me. He couldn't see it. And then I finally decided, well, I'm going to look at him. And I looked at him, and he went, and I went, and then he jumped over by his mate, and I jumped over by Jane. And at that point, he came right at the glass, and again, the imitation ended. But the point I'm making is imitating is really powerful. And uh, this is true in interviews, in jobs. Uh, if you are talking to somebody who is really laid back, and you're kind of high-powered, you need to tone it down. You just need to imitate that laid back style. And you want to be yourself, but you need to imitate. And you have a lot better chance of getting the job. Now, Jane and I have been married, we said the other day, since 1971. Got married at New Providence Presbyterian Church right here in Maribel. So I haven't gotten a chance to try this one because I've been married all these years. But I learned about this later, that if you go into a bar and you want to pick somebody up, you just imitate that person wherever they are, whatever they're doing, and there's a connection. They don't even know why. Okay, that's enough about that. You got the point. Uh, but I, I just haven't gotten to try it. If you're single, you can try it. Okay, so now I want to say uh, one more thing about a model uh, that I have in my life, um, and that is my mother's mother who died a few years ago. I uh, called her Grandma Corey. I lived with her for three years in college, three of the uh, four years. Wonderful lady. Her husband had died. I loved her husband. I loved Grandpa Corey. He bought me my first mitt. We used to watch the game of the week with Pee Wee Reese, you know, and Dizzy Dean. Some of us are old enough to remember that. And uh, he smoked smelly cigars. He got colon cancer. And, and back then, when you were a kid, you couldn't go in the hospital to visit. And so once he went in the hospital, he was gone. And she never remarried. She was a strong Methodist lady. And a character, such a character, Grandma Corey. She modeled the faith for me. Here I was having all these questions about whether I really believed in God when I got in college. Here I was going to go into, I was majoring in religion. I was thinking about going to ministry, and I was having doubts. And she would talk to me about it, and she would say, it's okay, you know, it's like this. Grandma Corey was such a character, I mean, and she wanted everything proper, you know. I could never come to dinner without a shirt on, or, or, and I could never wear a hat at dinner, you know. It was, she was very proper. And she also, you know, had everything very clean. Uh, and just, my gran they had twin beds. She, I remember my grandpa telling me years before that they had twin beds in their bedroom. 
and she was so proper about everything, he said, when he'd get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, he'd come back and find the bed made. You know, this was, this was my grandma Corey, right? Uh, I, remember, I remember I came home one day and I said, oh, you've got the uh, silver service out and the china and all this on the table, and you must be having a, a, a dinner or a lunch. Yeah, I'm having lunch with my group of, of ladies from the church in my Bible study. And I said, oh, really, when is it? Next week. Oh, she had it already, already set up. So she didn't stop mowing her own lawn until she was in her 80s. And she used to go on these trips with her cousins from Topeka, Kansas. And uh, they were all female, and they were just kind of fun. And they went trips different places. They went to El Paso once. They had a male cousin in El Paso who took them across the border to Juarez. It's a very dangerous place, Juarez, you know? And I said, Grandma, what'd you do? Well, we went to a bullfight. Grandma! In our 80s, you go to a bullfight? What are you doing? It's awful. It's bloody. She, oh, I didn't like it very much. I said, well, what'd you do after that? He, he took us to a strip tease joint. Grandma, you went to, what happened? She said, well, a scantily clad young lady danced about on the tables. I said, what did you think? She said, well, it, took, it certainly took my mind off the bullfight, she said. <laughs> okay, so this is my grandma, Corey. Well, in her 90s, she moved into Methodist Manor, which is a lot like Shannondale or Asbury. And she came into the dining hall, and she saw a lady uh, sitting over in the corner all by herself. And she said, what's the deal with her? Oh, well, she doesn't talk to anybody. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to her. No, no, we've all tried. Well, I can tell her about my grandchildren. I can talk all night about that. No, you can try. So she went over and sat down. The lady just stared at the wall, eating her dinner, never looked at Grandma. Grandma went for days, weeks, talking to this lady never replying. One day, the lady turned to her and began talking. And a few days later, my grandma Corey died. Never think that God is through with you. That God has something to do with you and for you and through you to the very last moment of your life. We're going to move to the last two, and I'll move right on through these. These have roots in the Old Testament, twin covenants in tension, in the um, Sinaitic covenant, which is the Decalogue, and in the Abrahamic covenant, so that you have social justice and evangelism in the Old Testament. Social justice, care for the widows, orphans, and strangers, uh, doing proper behavior, which is what the Ten Commandments are, of course. And the Abrahamic covenant is Abraham and Sarah are told in the uh, retirement community they're going to have a baby and Medicare is going to pick up the tab and it's going to be a wonderful life and they think it's crazy and I'm going to make a great nation of you. Notice that it isn't the human beings who are going to do the evangelism. It's the God. It's God who's going to do it through them. That's like evangelism and social justice, social justice and evangelism in the Old Testament. They come together in the New Testament in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who never separated them, who never said one is left and the other's right, never said social justice is a left-wing liberal thing like we talk about in this country, and evangelism, that right-wing conservative thing. No, Jesus said both are important. And in the Luke-Acts tradition, we see both, right? And, I mean, the whole the book of Acts is the only place where Jesus tells a good Samaritan story. And it's the only place where he says, care for the widows, orphans, and strangers. So, that's social justice. The whole book of Acts is evangelism. So, the Luke-Acts tradition, I think, is the model for the 21st century church, if you think about it. And social justice and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. I'll go through these two and then, then we'll be finished tonight. Well, the truth is your brain really does like doing things for others, particularly people who are different, people who are hurting. Uh, it's hardwired in the neurobiology of our brains. And when we do other things, and it's now been proven by a couple of neuroscientists in the book called The Wonder Drug. It's a fabulous book, by the way. Seven scientifically proven ways that serving others is the best medicine for yourself. 
whenever you feel a little bit down, go and do something for others. Even if it's just pray for others. If you're, if you're caught up in your own stuff, then you need to get out of your own stuff, right? You need to get a life. You need to get over yourself. And the way you do that is by helping others. That's what really what social justice is. Uh, it's about understanding ethics. Uh, one year, when I was in Pittsburgh, still as president of the seminary, I got invited to AAAS headquarters, the American Association for the Advancement of Science that publishes the journal Science. And they invited me and a theologian from Duke Divinity School and a little short rabbi from Yeshiva University in New York City. And I mean, it was a fascinating. We met with the whole senior management for an entire day, the, uh, the CEO and the senior management. And they said, we want you to help us create a healthy dialogue between science and religion in this country. They are not enemies, and we want you to help us help the country see that. It was amazing. Uh, a, a couple of years before, I had been lecturing at New College in Oxford. Uh, it's called New College because it was new in 1379. And as I told you the other night, dinner was like a scene from Chariots of Fire or Harry Potter, and we'd put on our gowns, and oh my gosh, it was amazing. Well, we were at lunch one day, and Jane Shaw, who at that time was Duke of, uh, the dean of Duke, Divin excuse me, dean of divinity at that school, turned to me and she said, "Do you see the guy four rows down from you?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "That's Richard Dawkins, the genet gen geneticist atheist, and he won't even have a conversation with a religious person. So don't even try. He doesn't like religious people." She said, "We duke it out." with um, each other in op-ed pieces in the London Times about every three months. And sure enough, I could never get the guy to talk to me. But by contrast, the largest scientific community in the world, AAAS, wants to know what I and some other theologians think. And Alan Leshner, the CEO, came to me and said, I'm fascinated by the research you've done. There's some neuroscientists who are gonna meet, wanna meet you, and I said, okay. Three days later, I get a call. This is Judy Ellis. I am a leading uh, neuroscientist at Stanford. Alan Leshner, are you William Carl? Yes. Alan Leshner says, we're supposed to talk, and I do whatever Alan Leshner says. When are you going to be in Northern California? I said, in about a month. She said, swing by Palo Alto. I want to meet you. So I did. We spent, Judy Ellis is now up at uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver at a huge neuroscience lab that she has up there. But at the time, she was one of the leading neuroscientists at Stanford. And she said, uh, let's talk. And we spent three hours on the brain, back and forth, boom, 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 boom. At the end, she said, I want you to join a new society I'm creating with Stephen Hyman, the pro provost at Harvard, who's also a neuroscientist. And it's going to be called the International Neuroethics Society. And we are going to examine the moral and ethical implications of the new neurotechnology industry. And I want you to join. I said, Judy, I, I don't even have a degree in this. She said, trust me, you just finished your oral defense for a PhD at Stanford in neuroscience because you know enough. Now, I can't give you the degree because you didn't take the courses, but you know enough. And so I did join, and it's been absolutely fascinating, the discussions that we have. One of them, I remember, it was in DC, Washington, D.C. I was sitting on the front row, and one of the professors from Oxford was saying, well, we've got a drug now that will make the, the whole world smarter, and make, it'll increase everybody's IQ, and it'll be a better world. And my hand went up on the front row, and I said, excuse me, I think the book and the movie about Jeff Skilling and, and Ken Lay at Enron was called The Smartest Guys in the Room. Do you really think increasing everybody's IQ will make it a better world? So these are the kind of things we debate. Uh, one is that a uh, drug that will erase bad memories. Oh, is that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. You know, maybe you had a post-traumatic brain injury and you got some awful stuff from the war, but, you know, you become a different person if we erase the bad things. D d let's do it on a global scale. Should we erase? Should we erase the Holocaust from humanity's memory? No. So these are the kind of things we debate. Uh, I want to mention a little about the church I served in Dallas. It has the largest social ministry program in the country. I had 100 on the staff. 34 of them did social justice full-time. 
Home for Battered Wives and Children, All Night Shelter, on and on and on, 600 homeless learning, uh, being fed every day, uh, uh, dental clinic, ophthalmological clinic, medical clinic. You know how it started? Millions of meals have been served there. You know how it started? One can of stew. They had a lot of homeless coming to the door. And an elder at a session meeting said, I move that we hand him a can of stew. And that was a long debate, but it barely passed. And the next month, the same elder said, I move that we hand him a can opener to go with the can of stew. You know, you know Presbyterians don't like to rush into these things, right? Well, one elder stood up and said, well, I'll tell you what, I will give $1,000 to this thing and see what, let's see what happens. That was a big mistake. Let's see if God blesses it. Oh, big mistake. To ask God to bless something like helping the poor. So all of a sudden the word was out. The line was down the street, two blocks to City Hall where Ruby shot Oswald there in downtown Dallas. And the word got out. And Helen Parmley from the Dallas Morning News sent a reporter down, took a photograph. And the picture was on the front page of the Dallas Morning News. And the money started rolling in from all over the city. And you know the magic words for elders in the Presbyterian Church on whether or not they're going to do a program? The money is already there. And this program just took off. So when I'm trying to decide to leave Union Seminary to come be their senior pastor, you know, I didn't want to leave Union. I, I, you know, I like the three th great things about academia, June, July, and August, you know. I, I didn't want to leave that, but they were trying to get me to come. So I said, I want to just come in and worship. Don't talk to anybody about me. I just want to see what it feels like. And I love the music. I love the experience, how friendly everyone. But then I went around to the parlor. And I'll never forget this. I walked in the parlor, and um, there were three street people in rags, smelly, in this beautiful parlor with china and silver service and oriental rugs and beautiful paintings, oil paintings. And nobody seemed to be bothered by them. And they were wolfing down donut holes like they were going out of style. And it was like, I, I've never seen this in a Presbyterian church, this gorgeous parlor and these street people. What? And this guy comes up to me in a blue pinstripe suit and a little American flag in his lapel, and, and he kind of had a John Birch look about him, and he said, you're new here. And I said, yeah, you visiting? I, yeah, I didn't want to tell him I was the candidate to be senior pastor. And he said, well, you know, we're glad you're here, but I got to tell you, you know these guys over here, they're street people. Well, that was sort of obvious. And I said, yeah, I see that. And he said, you know what? And I said, what? He said, we started this program a few years ago. I voted against it. I think we ought to have these smelly people in here like this. And I said, oh, really? And he said, but you know what? And I said, what? And he said, somebody showed me. He picked up a Bible off the coffee table and it opened up to Matthew 25. He said, somebody showed me in a, where Jesus said, we ought to take care of these people. And I said, by God, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And I thought, whoa, this conservative-looking guy has been converted to doing social ministry. I think this is the church I'm supposed to come to. I, go, I took it as a sign of that. Social ministry is not hard to sell. I figure there are three kinds of audiences, right? If you're trying to sell, we're going to do something for the poor, right? The first is bleeding heart liberal Democrats, they're already there. The second, with my good conservative Republican friends, I will say, look, you want to pass it out at the federal level with welfare and all that stuff, or you want to do something here at the local level where you can see where your money's going. Yeah, the local level. All right, Andy, up. And they would give. And we had a program called Step Up Ministry where we took people who were on the margin, we put them up in apartment complexes we had bought, taught them how to manage their money, how to get back on their feet. After three months, they had to get out, and 76% of them are back in society. That sells to people who want to do to make a difference. So that's the, those are the first two. The third group are somewhere in uh, sort of religious. And remember, Jesus said, in as much as you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. You just play that card with them. So it really doesn't matter how you play. You just got to figure the right audience to play it, right? Okay, let's end up with evangelism, which is the neuroscience of good news. 
Evangelism, scary words, the big E word for Presbyterians particularly, you know. We can get into social justice, help the poor, but evangelism, I don't know. We're pretty good at talking about it, having a committee for it, you know. I don't know. I love the story of the Norwegian fisherman who went out every day and he came in with a boatload of fish and everybody got suspicious. And the game warden said, I want to see where your secret fishing hole is. Yeah, okay, so he goes out with him. He goes out in the middle of the lake. He said, this is it? Yeah, right here. And he says, well, let's fish. And he goes, okay. He reaches his tackle box, pulls out a stick of dynamite, lights it, throws it in the lake, blows up the lake, and there's fish everywhere. Goes around and starts picking up. Game warden goes crazy. He said, I can't believe you did this in front of me. Don't you know I can throw you in jail and throw away the key? The old Norwegian fisherman picks up another stick of dynamite, lights it, hands it to him. He said, you going to fish or are you going to talk? <laughs> right? That's where we are in the Presbyterian Church. We're really good at talking about it, right? But we're actually going to do it. Now, the truth is, if you think of soteria as wholeness and health and, and, you know, peace and harmony, then you can have a broader understanding of evangelism that you're, when you're offering positive encouragement to people, you're sharing soteria. You're helping them understand who Jesus really is and what he's all about. And what you're doing is reinforcing, and I have it right here, uh, there's a lot of evidence that there are specific parts of the brain uh, in specific peri uh, parts of the uh, limbic system uh, in the, the ventral striatal dopamine systems are implemented when you do something to encourage other people. Uh, I have on the slide there a lot of pictures of Emily Blunt and Maya Angelou, uh, Angelou and my, Bill Gates, Damar. Hamlin, the guy who died on the field, the Buffalo Bills player just died. And every single one of them, uh, and Willie Mays is there, every single one of them had somebody when they were down and struggling who cheerleaded them, who encouraged them. I think that is part of what evangelism is. Uh, Alex Haley did that for me. You know what his great mantra was? Find the good and praise it. And he did that with everybody. He didn't just do it kind of as a thing. He did it because that was his personality. Maybe somebody had done it for him a long time before. He's the reason I wrote this crazy novel, this international espionage, Dan Brown meets Daniel Silva. No, because 30 years ago he was sitting in my office in Dallas and he said, have you written anything? And I said, yeah, I've written some nonfiction books. Let me see one. And I pulled one off the shelf. It was a set of lectures I'd given at Princeton. And he was sitting there thumbing. This is the author of Roots is thumbing my book. And he looks at me and he says, Bill, you need to write a novel. I said, what makes you say that, Alex? He said, two things. One, you know how to write. You write really well. Two, you know how to tell a story. That's all a novel is. I said, what would I write about? He said, what kind do you like? Tom Clancy, Jason Bourne, Robert Ludlum, International. Write one like that. I go, Alex. I don't know anything about any of that. He said, well, write something you know about and then mix it with that. You're a Greek scholar. Yeah, old manuscripts. Take it off. So that's how it started 30 years ago, and now 12 revisions later it's done. And I dedicated the book to Alex, who helped me find the good. And he praised it in me. I mean, I had the doctor who said, you ought to come lecture on the brain. You know? And, and you can be that kind of encourager for someone else. I, had a, uh, I was at a presbytery meeting. I had, a, I had a hard, long day in Dallas, and I was tired. And then I had to go to a presbytery meeting, which didn't particularly perk up my spirits. But I went to the meeting anyway, and I was sitting out there just feeling kind of sorry for myself. You know, pastors have hard days. Every once in a while, you have a hard day. Everybody does. And I was just sitting there, and then one of my former students from Greek, uh, from Union Seminary, got up on the stage. He was going to be examined uh, for ordination. Now, back in the day when they examined, they used to examine us, th these examinations could go on for a couple of hours, and they could ask you anything they want, you know, about philosophy, theology, Hebrew, Greek, the Bible, anything. 
At the end of one of those exams, uh, uh, there was a student that was just so exhausted, and an elder stood up in the back row and said, Young man, I have one final question. You, would you be willing to go to hell for the glory of God? He said, Sir, I'd be willing for this whole presbytery to go to hell for the glory of God. <laughs> it's not that way anymore. You know, they pass them on through really fast. Yeah, they pass them on through so fast now. And so I was sitting out there, and, and someone, the moderator said, anybody got a question? I found myself making my way out into the aisle of this big sanctuary to the microphone. And I said, hello, Michael. And he went a little pale, and he said, oh, hello, Dr. Carl. I said, as your former Greek professor, I have a Greek question I want to ask you. The whole presbytery sucked air in unison, glad that they weren't up there. And, and I said, the question I want to ask you is, do you remember any of the Greek at all that I taught you? The moderator says, you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. And he said, no, 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 I'd like to try with the Lord's Prayer in Greek that Dr. Carl taught us. And he started in, a hush fell over the presbytery as he started in, pater hemon haim toisu and ois hagi astheto tanamasu el thato hei basileasu genetheto ta telemasu and on and on. He went to the prayer and the whole presbytery erupted into a standing ovation and I gave him a thumbs up like that from the pew because I knew that my life had been worthwhile because I had made a difference in at least one student's life. That's the great joy of a professor. So I want to close with this story. Um, we, we have the great honor to share the gospel every single day of our lives in all different kinds of ways by encouraging others and sharing good news with them. So several years ago, I was invited to give the invocation at the swearing in of the new Secretary of Education under George H.W. Bush. And you could probably guess who that was. And I was standing, uh, I was sitting next to Barbara Bush, and we were waiting for the president to come out. It was at the uh, Air and Space Museum, in front of the Lunar Landing Module. A lot of senators, a lot of congressmen, the cabinet, huge event. We were up on the, on the dais. And I was sitting next to Barbara Bush, and she turned to me and she said, you know, this is, this is really a big deal. And I said, Mrs. Bush, everywhere you go, it's a big deal. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, of course. And, and then uh, I was getting ready to do the invocation. And by the way, when you speak at a podium with a presidential seal on it, uh, the podium is made to make the president look good. So the podium was really high because George H.W. Bush was tall. So I, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to peek up over the top of it when I do it. But just before the president came out to hail to the chief, one of the aides came running out and said, Dr. Carl, uh, we need to let you know that Alex Haley is stuck in a snowstorm in Minnesota. And uh, could you do the introduction of the president? And I go, oh, uh, well, yeah, okay. And I began, my mind was racing of all the, the, the uh, kinds of introductions I've done of famous and infamous people and the way to do, I've taught people on how to do introductions, how not to do them, what to say. You know, if it's Albert Schweitzer, you don't just say this is a doctor, you have to tell a little bit more, right? So I'm thinking, oh, former congressman from Texas, former vice president, uh, did this at the CIA, my mind's just racing. What am I going to say about George H.W. Bush? And they said, no, no, no. This is what you will say. And they handed me a tiny little piece of paper, a little slip. And so when it came time, I got to the podium. I peeked up over the top of it. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. It's the easiest introduction I've ever done. I got back to Dallas, and then he came out to hail the chief and this and that. I, I got back to Dallas and I was telling some people about it. He said, that's amazing. A lot of people never even meet the president, you know, whoever the president. But to get to introduce 
the president of the United States. It's unbelievable. What an honor. And I said, yeah, it was an honor. But not near the honor that you and I have every single day of our lives to introduce the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now that, my friends, is a real honor. Thank you very much.